Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Frank Rausen Pereira. The Supreme Court on Monday agreed to hear the PIL of BJP leader and advocate Ashwini Upadhyay challenging Article 370 and separate constitution of Jammu and Kashmir. The apex court tagged it with another pending matter and will hear all matters on Tuesday the 2nd of April. Article 370 of the Indian Constitution is an article that gives autonomous status to the state. The article is drafted in Part 21 of the Constitution, temporary, transitional and special provisions. The state of Jammu and Kashmir has been accorded special status under Article 370. All the provisions of the Constitution which are applicable to other states are not applicable to Jammu and Kashmir. For example, till 1965, Jammu and Kashmir had a Sadar e Riyasat for Governor and Prime Minister in place of Chief Minister. On this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyze Article 370. Joining me on the program today are Rana Banerjee, former Special Secretary, Cabinet Secretariat, Sushil Pandit, social activist, J. Sai Deepak, advocate of the Supreme Court, and Nasir Ahmed, senior journalist, will be joining us on the phone line from Srinagar. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. Uh, Sai Deepak, I'd like to begin the program with you. First, let's try and put into perspective and try and understand what Article 370 is. So, uh, you'll have to take a look at Articles 369 and 370 together in order to understand the nature of Article 370 because that's been the subject of discussion for a very long time. And as you rightly pointed out, the chapter that it, it is a part of effectively speaks of temporary provisions and special provisions. Especially the note or the title of this particular pro provision, Article 370, specifically says that this is a temporary provision as well. Now, what Article 370 effectively does is that as opposed to making all laws of India directly applicable to Kashmir. So if you look at any legislation, the first uh, art, uh, section of any legislation says that this shall apply to the entire territory of India except to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Mm. And this is a direct consequence of Article 370, which is to say that those laws which form part of the union list and the concurrent list shall be made applicable as far as this particular state is concerned with the uh, consent of the president provided it is uh, those uh, subject matters find reference in the accession instrument as well. So that's basically the gist of it. Therefore, to some extent, it grants autonomy to this particular state. Now, what is in contest today is uh, the specific sub-article of Article 370, which allows the president to issue an order to say that this particular provision shall cease to exist mm -hmm. or it shall cease to be in force. But that has a further proviso, which basically requires the... Uh, let's say the recommendation of the Constituent Assembly of the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Now the question is once the state has come into being, where is the question of a Constituent Assembly or can, there, can it be said that even if the Constituent Assembly ceases to exist, after that the proviso does not have any meaning at all and therefore the President is free to issue a notification or a presidential order thereby abrogating or uh, repealing this entire provision hmm. altogether. So the sum and substance of the debate around Article 370 is whether that provision has now become a cast in stone for all times to come or does the Union of India, the Parliament and the President still have the power to repeal this particular provision or to remove it, thereby making the relationship between Jammu and Kashmir and the Indian Union the same as the relationship between the Indian Union and any other state. Absolutely. So that's basically the question. Right. Uh, Sushil Pandit, let's go back to the history now. You, you know... And why haven't we really been able to put an end to this problem? We are in 2019 now. You know, if you want to go to the very beginning, when the proposal came to the chairman of the drafting committee of our constitution, Dr. Bhimrao Ambedkar, he summarily rejected the proposal, saying, I won't be a traitor to this newly born, uh, newly independent nation because it is uh, pernicious to the very spirit of our constitution and citizenship, which, is, which treats every citizen as equal. It was after a lot of pushing and plodding by the then prime minister of the interim government. Uh, so under Duras, literally, his deputy introduced this, even after the Congress Working Committee unanimously rejected it to accept this provision as part of our constitution with a provisio that Mr. Saidipak just said, it's a temporary and transient provision. It's been more than 70 years, it remains temporary and transient. 
primarily because there is a huge vested interest it has gathered over the period. There is a huge political inertia it has engendered over the period. And today, uh, you find a complete lack of political will to even look at it. I sometimes feel good that Supreme Court from time to time at least summons courage to review certain things, though till now it has reached some very uh, sterile, moribund kind of conclusions which lead us nowhere. Suffice but is, it to is say, political will enough to really settle this particular absolutely, issue? Absolutely, absolutely. What does it, uh, this article do? As, as Mr. Saideepa uh, pointed out, being a lawyer, he gave you all the finesse and technicalities. It circumcises the will of our highest sovereign body called the parliament. This parliament has a right, a jurisdiction over every square inch of India's territory, except the state of Jammu and Kashmir. And from this article flows another perversion called 35 capital A. It was exercising his rights under 370 that president was obliged to make a proclamation on 23rd of June 1954, granting such rights, such sweeping rights to the state of Jammu and Kashmir, that it almost gave them immunity vis-a-vis -vis the constitution of India. And the decisions that they took could not be challenged in any court under any provision of Indian constitution. Now, such perversions have been allowed to persist in, in our constitution and despite challenges from time to time, courts toss it in the court of politicians and the executive. Executive does nothing and people keep approaching the courts time and again. This circus must end. We must remove this anomaly once and for all and restore some normalcy. Right. That right. is the, the crux of the issue today. You know, Mr. Banerjee, Mr. Pandit says the circus must end, but who's going to end the circus really and how, how, how do we see Article 370 being abrogated? This is as at best a rather one-sided view. In my opinion, history provides a much more complex backdrop to the accession of Jammu and Kashmir. The provision under Chapter 21 is not only temporary and transient, it is special purposes. So, the word special has assumed greater significance in my view than the word temporary. Article 373, the power of the president is bound by the requirement to have the assent of the Constituent Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir, which existed for 10 years, but it lapsed in 1957. Thereafter, the perception has developed, particularly among the people of Jammu and Kashmir, that this is a special provision. And we have to today recognize that the people of Jammu and Kashmir joined the Indian state, seeking space in a situation where they were insecure about their identity and future. Now the perception has persisted and the way we have handled the alienation of the people of Kashmir, particularly of the valley, has concretized uh, you know, this feeling of insecurity. So in this backdrop, to talk of doing away with you know, uh, this provision seems rather dictatorial and repressive in my view. All right. Jay Said, okay. Uh, respond with first and then I'll come to yeah. you. Yeah. See, the word special applies to Article 371, not 370. Correct. Though the chapter has a general heading, Correct. but the word special is not in the context of Article 370. So, for the sake of fact, let me put the uh, record straight. But what it certainly says, it is temporary and transient. Mm. Now, if we persist with this temporary and transient provision for more than seven decades, there is something wrong. It needs to be examined as to what has been the use of such an autonomy in all these years. Right. What have they done? I'll tell you, well, as a measure of autonomy, they were given a constituent assembly which gave them a constitution. What does that constitution do? It doesn't have fundamental rights. What does that constitution do? It fails to identify minorities in the state. The perversion is that today, 70% population of the state is the minority. 
a mere 25 percent population of the state is the majority we kashmiri hindus who were five percent less than five percent community in the valley which today is almost 99.9 percent .9 muslim were a majority all the schemes all the provisions all the protections that were meant for minorities are given to the majority of the state hmm. so the Dis table so the tables have turned in jammu and kashmir is what you're saying despite supreme court's intervention right. despite its suggestion that they constitute a minorities commission in the state they have not yet done it right Talking about the Supreme Court, Chief Sai Deepak, you know, in the Supreme Court doesn't seem to have a definitive answer really as far as this particular issue is concerned. I don't think the Supreme Court is completely decided on this issue because uh, news reports tend to give an extremely, uh, I think, uh, I think uh, misrepresented view of what exactly was said by the Supreme Court in April 2018. But before that, I just have to add a few things, mm. especially by what was said by one of the panelists. If the perception of the people is supposed to dictate legal reality, then quite a few provisions. could be interpreted based on popular perception uh, i can't think i mean i can think of several issues which are uh, uh, are actually being discussed in national discourse today where public perception is at variance with what the supreme court is saying so what are we supposed to do with respect to those provisions then or with respect to those legislations then so i don't think we must use public perception as an argument to distort what exactly is the legal position so let's start with the facts the word special is not to be found with reference to article 370 fact or not it's a fact point number 1 point number 2 unlike article 369 which specifically mentions a time frame by when the temporary phase would lapse there is no such time frame that is mentioned as far as article 370 is concerned nevertheless it still uses the word temporary therefore it can only come to the you can only come to the conclusion that the 6 month period was deemed as not sufficient as far as 370 is concerned but it was never meant to be ad infinitum that's point number 2 point number 3 is he used the specific word ascent and i'm sorry to say that that's not the language the operative word in the proviso to article 370 that relevant provision is recommendation of the constituent assembly and not the assent or the consent of the or concurrence of the constituent assembly therefore one the assent of the constituent assembly is not needed two public perception cannot be the basis for a legal interpretation as to what was the intention of the constitution and how it must be interpreted today but if you really want to use public perception then we can't be guided entirely by the monolithic opinion of the people in the valley because it consists of people from ladakh as well as from jammu in which case you need to ask what do they think according to them article 370 should not exist because as a consequence of article 370 the rest of the regions of jammu and kashmir do not enjoy a normal relationship with the indian union and the consequence of article 35a is that no other indian from outside jammu and kashmir can ever hope to go to that particular place and be treated as an indian which he enjoys in any other place including in places like assam which do have a right to protect their indigenous identity mm. and still they do not have a problem with any other member of the indian community settling in that particular place so surely kashmir or let's say people of the valley of kashmir cannot expect a treatment over and above the treatment that india gives to indigenous tribes as well so that is one point so we have to ask ourselves do we wish to normalize the situation or do we wish to keep the status quo alive so that a few cottage industries survive okay cottage in uh, activist industry let's put it that way therefore as far as i am concerned if you are looking at normalization and if jammu and kashmir wants to be a part of the development or other part of the development journey of india then it must normalize its relationship and the opinion of that particular state cannot be decided on the basis of the opinion of the people of the valley others do have a say who is prerogative point. is it to ensure that they normalize the situation because everyone's got a shot at it Absolutely. and we I are agree. still and we are still here today frankly speaking the buck starts and stops with the central government when you when you speak of political will the answer is that the central government which is in charge of security national and or rather domestic and outside or external it is supposed to ensure that this state doesn't become or continue to be the flashpoint for everything about india especially when it comes to comes to its foreign policy you're looking at normalization of foreign policy you wish to assert yourself on the table of high powers then you might as well resolve this particular issue so i think the central government needs to take a concrete opinion on the supreme court issue this is something that's important the judgment of the supreme court in 2016 with respect to the sarfasi act hmm. was in the context of whether the sarfasi act applies to the state of jammu and kashmir and not with respect to the need for the continued existence of article 370 therefore this was not directly an issue as far as that particular judgment is concerned 
In April 2018, last year, it was reported that the Supreme Court had apparently observed, I think Justice Adarsh Kumar Goel and Justice Arif Nariman, that perhaps this particular provision has acquired a permanent status. The context of that particular observation, it's not a finding, right. is that there was a petition filed by a lady, public interest litigation filed by Kumari Vijayalakshmi Jha before the Supreme Court, or sorry, before the Delhi High Court, asking for a constitutional interpretation of Article 370 so that it can be struck down. To say that it is enough, it has, it has served its purpose for a lot of people and for the wrong reasons, but the job is done. Mm. There, just, the Chief Justice of the Delhi High Court along with Justice Jayant Rath, pronounced a judgment in 2017. I think from there is where an SLP was preferred against the particular judgment, where the petition was dismissed. In the context of that particular SLP, the special leave petition, is where the Supreme Court came out with just a findings or let's say an observation on that particular day that perhaps it may have acquired a permanent status. Mm -hmm. But that is no indication of what the final outcome could be. Today's petition, I suspect, has been tagged along with a host of petitions where Article 370 is at the heart of the debate. Right. So I think the issue is far from settled. Okay, the issue is far from settled is what you're suggesting. Mr. Banerjee, has Article 370 really outlived its utility? Is it time for it to go? If not, why? I don't think it's time for it to go. And why? I've already spelt it out. It is difficult for a purely legal interpretation to be rammed down the throats of the people wherever they are. And I do not believe that the Supreme Court, the highest judiciary of the country, can totally be bereft of ignoring the popular perceptions. I mean, this is evident in various other uh, judgments where, uh, you know, judges have had to backtrack from, you know, offers that they have accepted. So this is because of the public perception of an unseemly bias that may have crept into their decision making. So the same would apply in a larger context to the situation in Jammu and Kashmir. So I don't think that it is, the time is ripe for you know, uh, abrogation of 370. It could happen later and I uh, sympathize with the you know, issue of article, you know, the special uh, pro rights or the absence of you know, rights for women in Jammu and Kashmir uh, which have uh, resulted from interpretation of 35A. You know, for a, a woman of the state, if she marries an outsider, not to get the property or, be, or to be deprived of property, as also the you know uh, power of the state to uh, declare who are you know special citizens with rights. Uh, these uh, are an anomaly, perhaps, in in today's uh, you know world. But if you see the history of the you know interaction with between the centre and the state, uh, the autonomy has been slowly and gradually eroded and uh, by concessions made with acceptance of consensus of the people of Jammu and Kashmir, the 50 agreement, the 52 uh, Delhi Accord, the 1954 agreement, the 1974 Indira Sheikh Abdullah Accord. So gradually, gradually that would be the way to go in my view and uh, the atmosphere has to be right for the state to feel that now they can integrate fully. Uh, with the rest of the country right. and a, a stand of you know absolute nationalist patriotism uh, will not be able to solve this issue in my view all right yes Sai Deepak, and then I, I, I know you have to be elsewhere uh, Sushil yeah. Pandit so I'll just come to you very quickly after Sai Deepak. Yeah. so the doctrine of progressive realization of rights was introduced in the judgment of article 377 and which seems to have been applied in the Sabarimala case as well so the Supreme Court is concerned with the entry of women in a particular temple and their rights under Article 25. But somehow the rights of women in Kashmir and their ability to marry somebody from outside and its consequences on their ability to inherit property does not seem to catch the attention when it comes to the rights of women. I think that's equally important. Why should the rights of women and their ability to marry someone be held hostage to Article 370? What is the nexus? That is a relationship between the state and the union, the rest of the union. But what a, an individual chooses to do and what her rights are with respect to succession and inher inheritance of property, what is the connection? Hmm. Are we therefore saying that if a Muslim woman or let's say a woman from Kashmir chooses to marry from somebody from outside that particular state, it affects the relationship between India and Kashmir? Is that the extent to which we will take this? So I think these are aspects. Today we are talking of empowerment of women. Let's start with that empower the women in the valley to be able to marry anyone outside the particular state including an Indian from the rest of India mm. as just as I think uh, Kashmiris are equally Indians yeah. so I think that should be possible there, there must be a discussion on that issue okay start there is what you're suggesting of Sushil Pandit what's what's the best way forward uh, I'll give you two perverse consequences of such legislation one there are one million Indian citizens in the state of Jammu and Kashmir who vote for Lok Sabha cannot vote for Vidhan Sabha, cannot vote for Panchayat, 
do not have a right to study in state institutions or serve in the state government. They can't own property. They have been there for last four or five generations because right to state citizenship, the state subjectship, is arbitrarily exercised by the state. Two, there are Dalits who were welcomed into the state in 1957 when the state was facing almost an epidemic-like situation because of the, uh, a strike by their own Safai Karamcharis. They were given state subjectship. They came from, there were hundreds of Valmiki families from Punjab. You know what? They are told if your children, fourth generation, fifth generation, study, become engineers, doctors, architects, they lose state citizenship because if you want to be the state citizen, continue to be Safai Karamcharis. That's enslavement. Can you imagine in this day and age, this is perversion, this is not autonomy. And if this is what you've done with the autonomy given to you, I'm sorry. We've reached, we've dragged the state to the brink of collapse today. It has become, as Sai said, a, a, a flashpoint. It is a challenge to our, our uh, integrity. Under 35A, when they were given an, a wholesale immunity vis-a-vis -vis Indian constitution, they actually in writing identified the word integrity and the word secularism as an exception with which Indian constitution preamble would apply to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Can you imagine this kind of a challenge to our preamble? which says that India is a secular state, they say this word secular shall not apply to the state of Jammu and Kashmir if it, this constitution applies to the state. And the word, in, you know, there are certain obligations that a state is supposed to uphold. And one of the, them is that the state should uphold the integrity and unity of India. They identify in writing the word integrity as an exception with which this preamble shall apply to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Now this is nothing but perversion. And you cannot countenance this in this day and age. All right. Uh, Sushil Pandit, I know you have to be elsewhere. Thank you for Thank joining you so us on the program the and uh, you know, give, uh, sharing your views with us. Mr. Banerjee, that having been said, a start will have to be made at some point in time. And even you said, you know, when the time is right, probably we can see Article uh, 370 being abrogated. So what's the best way forward, really? Yes, I would be, you know, happy to accept this legal argument which Mr. Sai has given about women's rights. That could be a point from where to start and I'm sure uh, wiser counsel can prevail but the way forward in should be sought through consensus through political approach it cannot be rammed down through you know executive authority or you know judicial uh, diktat but are certain actors within the valley going to allow you know some kind of a political process to take place they have in the past you know, with, with the proper outreach to them. So I would think that efforts should continue in that direction. All right. Jaisai Deepak. Uh, whenever you speak of Kashmir, it is surprising that the Ladakhi voice is almost a marginal voice. Hmm. It's as bad or as good as the Northeastern voice being the marginal voice whenever you speak of larger India or mainstream India. To the extent that mainstream India, it seems like it, it excludes Northeast. To that extent, I think even Ladakhis are excluded from the mainstream discussion of Kashmir. I think it's important that they are given an opportunity, they are empowered to put forth their point of view. It is considered because it's a significant population and that region attracts a lot of tourism, which in, which in turn means that it generates a lot of income. Therefore, if it is the breadwinner or if it at least one of the significant contributors of income, then it has a right on the table to at least put forth this point of view. I am completely with Mr. Banerjee to the extent of saying that a cut and dried approach or a summary approach to such a complex issue and given its complex history would be wrong. But an approach which is designed to keep the interest or the particular issue alive for eternity because it allows a lot of people to, uh, to let's say, uh, occupy center stage and call themselves as the representatives of people. I think that needs to stop because at the end of the day, I don't see a representation coming from Jammu and from Ladakh when it comes to this particular issue. I suspect that Jammu and Kashmir, the entire issue is not a monolithic issue. There is a diversity of opinion. But when it comes to its projection, I don't think there is a diversity. That's where the problem is. Let's start hearing people from other regions of Kashmir and let's start uh, looking at solutions which allow or which empower women in that particular place. Let's see how that goes. Right. Yeah. Would you agree with that, uh, Mr. Banerjee, that you know we have to also take on 
the sentiments of the people living in the uh, Jammu region as well as the Ladakh region, they seem to be misrepresented uh, more often than not. Oh, absolutely. It should, it should be tried. It can be tried. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an option worth considering. But uh, again, you see, you cannot uh, compare the situation in Jammu and Kashmir with that in the Northeast. There itself, there are problems now coming up with the National Register of Citizens and the decision to pass the Citizenship Act, which gives, you know, Hindus coming from Bangladesh the, the right of citizenship. And this has, uh, you know, uh, put the backs up of the, the Assamese who, who are actually part of the uh, new government there. So, you can sort of uh, hit yourself in the foot in trying to, you know, be very flexible in uh, tackling complex issues. So, in, in Jammu and Kashmir, uh, Jammu and Ladakh, yes, they have uh, over time felt neglected about the, you know, uh, step uh, motherly treatment at, accorded to their people considering the sentiments of uh, the, and the sensitivity of the, of the valley. But uh, again, this would have to, this approach would have to be soft pedaled and right. uh, with, with some sophistication and, and finesse okay. to be able to move forward. All right. It's a very complex issue. It needs to be handled with tact, is what the panelists are suggesting. With that, it's a wrap on this edition of The Big Picture. I'd like to thank uh, all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us as well. And that's it from me. See you again next time.